How many of you all have enjoyed the start of our new series on relationships called It's Complicated? How many of you all enjoyed last week's series called Trust Issues? Come on, how many of y'all still working through some trust, trust issues? Say, the Lord is still working on me. He's still yet working. Amen. But you know, the, the, the thing about God is he never called us to trust man. He told us to love man. He never told us to trust man. Y'all going to catch that next week. Hallelujah. Y'all ready for the word of God today? Man, I'm going to read a rather lengthy scripture today. So if you can just remain seated at this time, um, we're going to be coming from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we're going to begin reading in verse 1, and then we're going to skip over to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John 13, 1 Corinthians 13, sorry, 1 John chapter 4. I want to shout out all, to all the single moms today. Listen, Pastor Jay's out on a preaching assignment, so I didn't have no help getting ready. So I had to get a baby ready on top of having to prepare to preach on top of trying to get out the house. How many of y'all know how hard it is to get out the house with kids, with a newborn? So give it up for all the single moms today. Y'all are my inspiration. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank God for my mother-in-law. She snuck in this morning. Miss Sarah Patrick is here. I told her, I said, if I'd have known you was coming, why didn't you come to the house to help me? <laughs> but thank God for her being here today. Y'all got 1 Corinthians 13? Amen. I'm going to be reading from the Passion Translation. All right, for the sake of emphasis of teaching today, I'm going to be reading from the Passion Translation. So if you don't know that translation, don't have it, you can just follow on the screen. The word of God reads, if I were to speak with eloquence in earth's many languages and in the heavenly tongues of angels, yet I didn't express myself with love, my words would be reduced to the hollow sound of nothing more than a clanging cymbal. And if I were to have the gift of prophecy with a profound understanding of God's hidden secrets, and if I possess unending supernatural knowledge, and if I had the greatest gift of faith that could move mountains, but have never learned to love, then I am nothing. And if I were so generous as to give away everything I own to feed the poor, and to offer my body to be burned as a martyr without the pure motive of love, I would gain nothing of value. Love is large and incredibly patient. Love is gentle and consistently kind to all. Somebody shout all. It refuses to be jealous when blessings comes to someone else. Love does not brag about one's achievements, nor inflate its own importance. Love does not traffic in shame and disrespect, nor selfishly seek its own honor. Love is not easily irritated or quick to take offense. Y'all gonna shut down on me now. Nudge your neighbor, say, stop being offended. Love joyfully celebrates honesty and finds no delight in what is wrong. Love is a safe place of shelter, for it never stops believing the best for others. Love never takes failure as defeat, for it never gives up. Love never stops loving. In other words, love is not conditional. First John chapter 4, beginning in verse 16, we're going to start with the B clause of this scripture. It says, God is love. Those who are living in love are living in God, and God lives through them. By living in God, love has been brought to its full expression in us so that we may fearlessly face the day of judgment because all that Jesus now is, so are we in this world. Skip down to verse 19. This is going to bless you. Our love for others is our grateful response 
to the love God first demonstrated in us. Anyone can say, I love God, yet have hatred toward another believer. This makes him a phony because if you don't love a brother or sister whom you can see, how can you truly love God whom you can't see? For he has given us this command. Whoever loves God must also demonstrate love to others. Hallelujah. I want to teach momentarily from the subject, it's not that complicated. Tell somebody it's not that complicated. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time together. God, I'm asking you to anoint me as your teacher, to teach your word with precision, with clarity. God, that today something would be transformed in our hearts to pursue a deeper love and revelation of who you are in our lives so that we in turn can love the way you have commanded us to love. We honor you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. It's not that complicated. So our series is called It's Complicated, right? So I wanted to throw a little monkey wrench to you all and pose the question, or statement rather, it's actually not that complicated. So we're going to dive into this today, and I'm going to do a lot of teaching. I'm not going to do a lot of hollering. So y'all, please don't fall asleep on me. Amen? So love as a word, it describes an emotion as we know it with vastly differing degrees of intensity. So for example, all the men out there, they can in one breath say, I love watching sports and eating chicken wings. And in the next breath say, I love my wife. Stay with me. And for us women, most of us women can attest to say, I love shopping. How many of y'all love shopping? Come on. All right, lift your hands to the Lord. Say, Lord, deliver me. Come on, see, some of y'all should have did my 21-day financial fast. That was a shameless plug. But in one breath, we can say we love to shop. And in the next breath, we can say we love our children. Stay with me. How many of you all can agree that love is one of the most powerful emotions that we can experience? Amen? The Bible lets us know that it's, the, it's love that conquers right it's the love of God that, co that covers sin and his, it's his love that draws us back to repentance love is a powerful powerful thing to experience and the truth is we were all born with an innate desire to experience love amen it's something that was built into the core of our DNA first John 4 and 16 tells us that God is love and Genesis 1 and 27 tells us that God created us in his image so if God is love and we were created in his image, that means we were all created with a desire to love and be loved. Amen? So I think we can all agree that love is one of the most simple yet so complex commandments given to us by God. So the dilemma that I pose to you all today is why is it so hard to do such a seemingly easy thing? If love was so easy, why is the divorce rate 50%? If love was so easy, why do most friendships end abruptly because of simple misunderstandings? If love was so easy, why is it so hard for Christians to get along? <laughs> Tell somebody it's not that complicated. So here's where it gets complicated. Everything that God creates, write this down, everything that God creates, the enemy will attempt to pervert it. Everything that God creates, the enemy will produce a counterfeit. And anything that resembles covenant, the enemy will attack. So today, I want to share with you and teach four forms of love that are found in the Bible because I want to be able to wrap some scripture and understanding around what God's desire for love looks like um, because we live in a hedonistic society. Everything is about us, my needs, 
my pleasure, me, me, me. And the Bible teaches us the exact opposite. Love is one of the most selfless things that you can master. Listen, I wish I could teach this like I felt it today. I really want y'all to get this in your spirit because everything in our culture is going to teach you opposite of what God desires for us in our lives. And you will never experience true love and true happiness in love until you get in God. So the four types of love we're going to talk about today, and they are communicated through four Greek words. The first one is eros, E-R-O-S, eros. The second one is storge, S-T-O-R-G-E. The next one is philea, like Chick-fil-A with an uh at the end, philea, P-H-I-L-I-A. And the last one is agape, A-G-A-P-E, eros, storge, Philea and agape. So we're going to explore these different types of love today, and they are characterized by romantic love, family love, brotherly love, and God's divine love. So let's talk about eros love. Let somebody say eros. Eros is the Greek word for sensual or romantic love. The term originated from the mythological Greek god of love, sexual desire, physical attraction, and physical love. So I know the babies are in the sanctuary today, so I'm going to try to keep it PG. But I think it's important for us to understand this type of love. This is the type of love that is, somebody say, reserved between a husband and a wife. The Song of Solomon warns us to not awaken or arouse love before it's time. In other words, singles, keep the cookie in the cookie jar. In a culture where sex outside of marriage is promoted as the new norm, I want to lift you today. Some of y'all ain't going to like me after I say this, but celibacy is still attainable. Yeah. Oh, I got two claps. I need some of the singles who say, you know what? I present my body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto him, which is my what? Reasonable service. That even though my flesh is craving something that God does not desire for me, I make a promise and a covenant with my eyes that I will stay holy before the Lord. And some of y'all say covenant with your eyes. Yeah, you got to make a covenant with your eyes because you can, you can commit adultery with your eyes before you, the act even happens. Because the moment the Bible talks about the moment you lay your eyes lustfully on a woman, you've already committed sin. Oh, I'm in the Bible, y'all. See, I knew I wasn't going to get a lot of amens on this message. That's all right. You've got to make a decision, singles, that it ain't going to be no test driving until it's time. I told the church a few years ago that every time you allow somebody to test drive, you depreciate in value. <laughs> y'all are real weak today. I'm going to preach this thing anyways. Tell somebody, don't lower your standard. singles you end up lowering your standard because you are afraid to be alone you have a conviction to do what God wants you to do but you're so desperate to be with anybody that you are willing to settle for somebody who does not respect the God that you serve you're willing to settle and lower the standard that you have set for your life and let me tell you something singles when you go into a relationship your flesh is going to scream Okay, let me let's just be honest. Your flesh is going to scream. But if you you have to make a decision when you enter into a dating situation with somebody that if you both don't agree that you know what? No ringy, no. Oh, okay. Okay. If you don't both first make an agreement together, you will not last. You won't last. You got to hold each other accountable. I'm talking about doing this the right way, y'all. Tell somebody, don't lower your standard. We got to understand that everything God creates, I said this a few, a few minutes ago, everything God creates, the enemy will attempt to pervert it. And sex was designed to be a beautiful thing. 
It's designed to be an experience that husband and wife are supposed to value, cherish, and appreciate. Into my see, into me you see. And when you come become one with someone, it's one of the most vulnerable experiences you ever have. And the reason why some of us, we keep failing in relationships is because we keep leading with eros slash lust rather than getting to know the person before, for who they are first. And we wonder why we keep getting hurt by people that don't know how to love us properly because we never took the time to assess that they were capable of love. Store J love. Store J love. S-T-O-R-G-E. Store J love is a Greek word that describes family love. It's the affectionate bond between uh, your brothers or your sisters, your bloodline. Um, it is the natural bond that develops between a parent and a child. How many parents do we have in here? Amen. Those of you all who follow me on social media, y'all probably have figured out by now that I absolutely adore my son. I'm telling you, there's a love that I have for this kid that I've never experienced before. How many of y'all parents, there's just, you can't fully explain it, but there's a love that develops in you when you have a child, because this child you are responsible for. You're responsible for their well-being. You're responsible for making sure that they experience love the right way. You're responsible for protecting them and keeping them guarded from danger. Amen? So there's this storge love that develops between an affection that you have that is birthed through this natural, this natural uh, uh, sibling slash parental uh, familial love. Amen. So then we have philea love, philea love, philea love is the type of intimate love in the Bible that most Christians practice towards each other. This Greek term describes the, describes the emotional bond seen in deep friendships. Philea is the most general type of love found in the scripture. And this is the love that um, encompasses our love for people. So this is our love that the person sitting next to you, that you should feel a philea love towards them. You may not even know them, but there is a love, a genuine love, sincere, sincere love that we should have towards our brothers and our sisters in Christ. Amen. Philea love is the concept of brotherly love that unites believers together to build his kingdom. Jesus even said in John 13, 35, that Philea would be an identifier of his followers. He says, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another love is the identifier of our faith if we don't love people I hate to break it to you but you really don't love God because there's no way that you can actually love God and hate your brother see I, I don't quite understand people that have this deep prayer life and can prophesy and speak in tongues and, and be all in the third heavens but can't even speak to somebody when you walk next to them See, it's time out for this hateful Christianity. See, y'all met him before. Y'all ever met the, the, ch the church mother that, you know, she gonna slay everybody out, lay hands on you, but she can't even speak to you right? See, we got to learn how to do this thing right. Because when we don't do this thing right and love does not exude out of us, we turn the world away. And the world is looking for something different. They're looking for genuine love. I told you guys a few minutes ago that we were all born with this innate desire and this longing to experience love. And so you may meet somebody that has a hard exterior, but if you break that exterior down, underneath is really a, 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 a somebody who is longing and to experience genuine love in their life. And then we have agape love. And this is where I'm going to land today and spend most of the rest of my teaching. Agape love is the highest of the four forms of love in the Bible. This term defines God's immeasurable, incomparable love for humankind. Agape love is the divine love that comes from God himself. 
This is not something that you can produce out of your own strength. This is a divine love. Agape love is perfect. It's unconditional. It's sacrificial. And it's pure. This is the kind of love that Christ demonstrated to his father and to all humanity in the way he lived and he died. God didn't, he didn't get up on that cross because he felt like it. He did it because he was trying to let you understand that I love you this much that I'm willing to lay down my life for you. How many of you all can say, how many of y'all husbands can say you're willing to lay your life down for your wife? That's the kind of love that God is expecting out of us. Christ demonstrated this love in the earth. He demonstrated, he had to come to this earth and live in a flesh suit to demonstrate to us what it was like to love people that even didn't like us. You know how many haters Jesus had and he still loved them the same? He, had, he even had people in his inner circle that denied him, but he still used them. That's the kind of love I'm talking about today. When you can love your enemies for real. When you can love those who despitefully use you. When you can love those who talk bad about you. I'm telling you, this is the kind of love that you can look at somebody in their face and, and say, I love you. And you know they just talked about you and mean it. This is the kind of love, y'all where you can genuinely smile in somebody's face who you know does not like you. I'm not talking about that fake smiling either. I'm talking about you genuinely, you know what? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. They don't even understand. And I understand that a lot of hurt people hurt people. So I see the wounds behind their actions. I don't see the, the actual action because I realize that what they are doing, they, uh, they don't even understand it. When Jesus went in his final, he said, you know what, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You will be free from the expectation of man when you really understand God's love. In this scripture, this love that I'm talking about, even following Jesus' resurrection, Jesus asked the apostle Peter three times, do you love me? Y'all remember that scripture? And when you look at the translation of the word love that he used, the word love that he used was translated agape love. Jesus was asking Peter the question, do you love me with an agape love? And Peter's response was, yes, Lord, I love you. Yes, Lord, I love you. Yes, Lord, I love you. And when you translate the, the word love that, that Peter used in response, Peter didn't use agape love. Peter's response was a phileo love. It was a brotherly love. Here's the revelation to note in this. During this time when Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? Peter had not yet experienced the infilling of the Holy Ghost. He had, they had not yet had the upper room experience in Acts chapter 2. So in other words, Peter was actually incapable of loving Jesus from a place of agape love because he had yet to experience the infilling of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> the reason why so many of us in here today are so unsuccessful in most relationships is we are trying to do a God thing out of our own flesh. You cannot love people the way God intended you to love, void of a relationship with the creator himself, void of a relationship with the one who imputed the love in us in the first place. Husbands, you will never be able to love your wives the way she deserves if you don't first pursue a relationship with God and allow him to teach you how to love your wife. Wives, you will never be able to honor and respect your husband the way God desires unless you first pursue a relationship with God and allow the wisdom and guidance of the Holy Spirit to teach you. The reason why most marriages end in divorce is because we think eros love will sustain us. 
And if we be honest, we're in relationships right now that we think are love, but it's really lust. We're confusing the lust of our flesh with an affection towards somebody because we laid down with them too early before we could even determine if we actually had the capability of loving them the way God desired us to love them. And see, it's a dangerous place to lay down with somebody before you get to know them because now you got your, mind, your heart and your emotions all mixed up into somebody, into what's called a soul tie. And I want to lift to you, those of you all who have fallen short of the glory and are preparing for marriage, you better learn how to divorce everybody that's been in your spirit before you attempt to go forth and to marry somebody for real. Because now you got a competition in war in your spirit comparing who... Mm. We don't need no competition in the bedroom, y'all. The kids are in here, so I'm trying to behave myself. There are some situations that you will face in your marriage that if we be honest, sex will not resolve it. There are some hardships that you will go through that the bedroom will not fix it. And some of y'all done watched Baby Boy way too many times and you think makeup sex was gonna solve something for you. Y'all laughing, but I am so serious right now. I am so serious. We must understand that marriage was never designed for the world. Marriage was designed for the church. I'm going to say it again. Marriage was never designed for the world. Marriage was designed for the church. And we got unsaved folk attempting to perform a spiritual act. You wonder why you're not successful. And it goes beyond. Let me tell y'all something. There's a reason why God called us to, to not be unequally yoked. Not because there's going to be disagreements in our religion. That, that's part of it. Not because we might have differences in how we want to raise our children. And all. all of that is valid. But the reason why God called us to not live unequally yoked is because how can you expect somebody to love you if they never experience the love of God? It's practically impossible to make a covenant with man if you've never made a covenant with God. Because covenant will tell you, on my good days, I choose to love. On my bad days, I choose to love. Why? Because covenant to God is not based on how you feel. Your covenant to God is based on who he is. And there's going to be times in your walk with God where you're going to say, God, where are you? You feel like God has left you. You feel like God has forsaken you. You feel that God is not present and he's forgotten all about you. But it's in those moments that you'll get a flashback of the last situation that he brought you out of. You realize that over 2,000 years ago, he put his body up on a cross and he died for our sins. And if he does nothing else for us, he's already done enough. And see, a lot of us, we treat God like Santa Claus. It's about everything that he can do for us and not anything about what we can give to him in response to what he's already done for us. Are y'all getting this today? Covenant will teach us that love is not a feeling. Love is a decision. Where are my married folk at? Love is a decision. Say that out loud. Love is a decision. It's a choice that you make every day that you wake up. And in order to remain in this kind of love, this longevity, how many of y'all really want your marriage to work for the long haul? How many of y'all singles want to get married and do it once and do it right the first time? I'm giving you the formula for success. In order to remain in this kind of love, we must first remain in him. And I'm telling you, we get frustrated because our spouse, our significant others, our friends, 
whoever you have placed an expectation on in your life to love you, we get frustrated because they can't love us the way we desire. And it's not because it's a fault of their own. It's because we are putting an unfair expectation on somebody that they are not capable of. Because if you are seeking a relationship with somebody based on completion, see, Jerry Maguire done messed us all up. You complete me. No, baby. Jesus completes you. Man compliments you. Man will never complete you. And as long as you are looking for man to complete you, you will wind up in relationship after relationship, friendship after friendship. And every time somebody disappoints you, you will move on to the next because you are placing an unfair expectation on somebody to do something that only God can do in your life. Singles, before you even attempt to get married, you gotta learn who God is first. You gotta fall in love with a relationship with him so he can then teach you how to love the way he intended us to love. Amen? This scripture, I, I, it blessed me so much First John chapter four, verse 19, in the Passion Translation, it says, our love for others is our grateful response to the love God first demonstrated in us. We love as a response to God's love. We love people as a response to how God has loved us. The world will tell us, I'll love you if you love me back. I'll serve you if you serve me back. I'll respect you if you respect me back. Amen. And until I'll love you until you hurt me and then I'll cut you off. I don't see this nowhere in scripture, y'all. The world will tell us I'll love you until you disappoint me. I hope this is helping somebody. This kind of love that I'm talking about today is not conditional. Jesus said, if you love me, then you must love others, period. No ifs, not if they do you right, not if they treat you right. Now listen, I didn't say you trust people, I said you love them. There's a big difference. And some of you are confused and trust with love and you can love people that you don't trust. You can know somebody's agenda and still love them. You can know that they're gonna hurt you and still choose to extend yourself to them. Why? Because when you have a revelation of what somebody is capable of, you have a fair expectation that, yeah, I know they're probably gonna hurt me, but guess what? Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. I'm still gonna love you regardless. Even Jesus had betrayers in his circle. Even Jesus had people that betrayed him and talked about him and stabbed him in the back. So if Jesus, Jesus said, if you want to reign with me, you got to suffer with me. And, and when we look at the story of Jesus, we have to understand that the same sufferings that he went through, these are the same things that we are not exempt from, y'all. The suffering that we go through oftentimes is correlated with somebody, a person hurting us, disappointing us, betraying us. And a lot of times... The suffering that we say we're going through is really not suffering. It's a result of our own bad decisions with people. I'm going through because he cheated on you. But if you, if you were in him first, the Holy Spirit would have shown you what he was capable of. See, y'all, can I get some music or something? I mean, something, y'all. Can y'all help me out over here? I'm joking. Man was never designed to complete us. There's a void that's in each and every one of us that can only be filled by a relationship with our creator. You can run from it all you want to. And I could go into a whole nother sermon about how we fill our lives with, with stuff, right? Activities, behaviors, and a lot of it's, most of it's dysfunctional because we are trying to satisfy a craving that only God can fill. 
Alcoholics don't want to be alcoholics for no reason. Drug addicts don't want to be drug addicts for no reason. They're looking for something to solve and resolve something on the inside of them that they have yet to experience. And people look for this euphoria of love. And I told y'all, love is not a feeling. But I promise you, when you come into a genuine relationship with the Father, Whew, he will heal every wounded place. He will mend every broken place. He will satisfy you when you wake up in the morning. You may not have a whole lot of money. You may not have a whole lot of support. But when you wake up in the morning, there's a joy that's on the inside of you. There's a peace that's on the inside of you that the world can when you come into a genuine relationship with the Father, He will teach you everything you need to know how to love people properly. He will teach you everything you need to know. Tell somebody it's not that complicated. Before you attempt to try to love anybody, let Him first teach you how to love. When you experience his love, I know, I know, you know, we talk about the cross a lot. We talk about the cross during communion. But do y'all really believe this thing for real? Like, do you really understand how much God loves you? Do you really understand that he went through this grueling act where he was whipped, he was beaten, a crown of thorns was placed on his head, nails were placed in his hands, nails were placed in his feet. Why? Because he was trying to exemplify to the world what unconditional love looked like. You can't do this out of your own strength. Peter did not know how to love Jesus with an agape love until he was filled with the Holy Ghost. Some of you today, you need to ask God to fill you again. Some of you need to ask God to fill you in the first place. It's time out for having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. If we want to be a church of love for real, listen, y'all, we, we didn't make this our mission because it sounds cute and we want brownie points in the community, but we genuinely want to love people for real. You will not be able to love people for real until you experience this kind of love. And this kind of love is only given through a relationship with him. How many of y'all desire to love people for real? How many of y'all really desire to love people even when they hurt you? See, most of us say, nah, I'm gonna write you off as soon as you hurt me. No, let's, let's, let's be honest. The moment somebody does something to, to hurt us, our first response is defense. Our first response is to shut you out. Snake bite you once, it's my fault. Snake bite you twice, right? The other way around, y'all, y'all know what I meant. Y'all got me. Jesus never said nothing like this in the Bible. He said love. Love is large and incredibly patient. Love is gentle and consistently kind to all. It refuses to be jealous when blessing comes to someone else. Love does not brag about one's achievements, nor inflate its own importance. Love does not traffic in shame and disrespect, nor selfishly seek its own honor. Love is not easily irritated or quick to take offense. Love joyfully celebrates honesty and finds no delight in what is wrong. Love is a safe place of shelter, for it never stops believing the best for others. Love, listen married folk, love never takes failure as defeat. It never gives up. Love never stops.